Well, hello again, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the concert. And we'd just like to say a very big welcome now to Karen Sharp, who's joining us for a bit of a chit chat, post-concert chit chat. And we're going to have a bit of a chat with Karen about her life and her music and tell us a bit about her influences and so on. So Karen, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to be with us. Perhaps we could just start a bit by, well, tell us a little bit about your early life, how you got into music and, and so on, because you're not originally a saxophonist, are you? Didn't you, you played clarinet and piano, is that right? Tell us, tell us a bit about what happened there. Yeah, so um, I did, well, I did piano really first and, and of course recorder. Um, and then um, on so I, so I got into piano quite young and then there's an amazing teacher at, at primary school who said to me you need to well she she suggested that I take up a second instrument which is really amazing advice really I mean I wouldn't have known but you know obviously it kind of gets you playing with other people if you play a portable instrument so so I took up the well initially it was a flute and I, I just I just got bought a flute you know, for Christmas or something and found it really, it was making me all dizzy. So they, they surreptitiously swapped it for a clarinet. And uh, that was it. Yeah, I didn't have lessons for a while. I sort of taught myself and I, I remember having my first lesson and there was like some glaring mistakes that I was doing and, you know, I was holding it wrong. And um, But it, it sort of just, just felt nice, natural. And uh, so I kept on with that. And that's, and then eventually I went to college as a composer and um, because I was a clarinetist, I was able to switch quite easily to the saxophone, which I did as a sort of diversion, really, just to take my mind off the pain of having to write um, squeaky gate music. <laughs> I see. So, so I actually went through all your teenage years playing clarinet then, a classical clarinet and, and piano, is that right? So, um, so where, did you, where did you go and study music? Uh, I went to the Royal Northern in Manchester as a yeah, composer first study. I, I wanted to be a pianist at that time first study but uh, you know you have to be sort of um like Ashkenazi to get a place it's, it's really really tough so but I was I I knew I wanted to be in that environment so I went to the composer which was fine because I've been writing music for a long time and um you know and it was kind of it does give you a nice sort of all-round broad musical education I suppose so it's, it suited me quite well and I was able to play sax and you know I went off and did gigs um quite quite quickly really and sort of it sort of took over. That's really interesting. So having started like classical, but obviously with quite a bent towards composition and stuff, you know, writing your own things, but not jazz, obviously, initially. So how did you get into the jazz thing? Did you start listening to jazz and think, oh my God, I want to be a sax player? And, and like, did you listen to particular sax players and not want to do that? Or did you just, was it just like, because there's quite a, you know, a lot of uh, sax players start on clarinet, don't they? And then sort of move to like Alan did and people, that's quite common, isn't it? So what was that, what was that path then? I, well, it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint exactly. I know I I mean I like the sound of the sax, and I did but I did try it at school. My my teacher, another really amazing teacher at secondary school, who's still playing. He was a jazz saxophonist, and he lent me his Mark VI alto. I remember walking home with it, not knowing what it was, and um, I didn't. I gave it back to him. I didn't get on with it, weirdly. Um, and but I used to play in little. I used to have a sort of ragtime band. You know, I used to write stuff and listen to lots of ragtime. And I also played in kind of played written out solos and, that he would give me. You know, at school, um, on clarinet and a bit on on the alto. But I didn't. It didn't really didn't really do much for me at the time. It just wasn't the right time, I guess. But I think having an ear for harmony, which I got from just the way I was taught piano, um, kind of got me into composing. And then yeah doing lots of ragtime and then I think it was a mixed tape that my teacher made for me which I wish I'd kept it just got lost somewhere and it was I mean it's just been amazing over the years hearing tracks out of the blue that think that was on that tape because I, I never really didn't really know any any of the um, artists that were on there so that was that was probably where it started and then I got to college and you know I just 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 I was sort of free from home and I wanted to spend money and I bought a tenor sax and <laughs> um, just happened to know loads of people and all the saxophone players really I just sort of hung, hung out with them and got into you know playing and jamming and stuff. Yeah yeah and that's really interesting but I didn't realise you played the alto at one point because I, I don't think I've ever seen you but you don't play alto now do you? Yeah I do yeah I mean not a lot I like playing alto, but I don't really have much opportunity. I, I occasionally, you know, it will come up for a big band or something. But um, 
yeah, it's, it's good. I mean, I think at the time, most of my playing life so far, I've been kind of drawn towards the lower end sound. I suppose I still am, but the, I mean, it's nice to cut through with the, the higher ones, the alto and soprano. I don't yeah. think I like soprano, but yeah, alto is nice. I mean, it's just, they're all so different and it's such a lot of work, you know, to keep them all, you know, good enough. Yeah, it's interesting because people I don't think realise that actually is, um, especially if you're playing a big band and stuff, you're expected to double, aren't you? And and I mean, on flute as well, right? Do you, do you, do you play flute still or not really now? Right. No, I, I have one and I can sort of, I can play it, you know, I could play kind of grade one pieces probably. Uh, I can make a sound, but I'd never take it on a gig. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite shocking when you take an instrument out and you just, you know, you're at home, you think, oh, it sounds quite good. And then you... <laughs> you're in a section and it's you know horrendously scary but I do play clarinet still and bass clarinet as well so I've, I've got that kind of end of it covered yeah um, the low end which I approve of obviously very much the low end <laughs> yeah. it's great to hear you playing the Barry just now on the on the concert you know because you're quite well known for being a Barry player aren't you so did you start playing Barry at about that time when you were in college as well did that come a little bit later no it was much later it was um Humph actually Humphrey Lipton just telling me that I needed to play it in order to join his band. I needed to double one tenor and baritone, so I had to get one. Um, I wouldn't have got one in a million years, I'm sure. Um, I don't know. But it's, yeah, so I was kind of forced into it, and it took a while. It, you know, it grew on me, and now I really like it. But it's, again, it's, you know, it's such a lot of work, and I find doubling tenor and baritone on small group gigs is really challenging. I still haven't kind of worked it out <laughs> um so you know if you kind of chop and change from one number to the next it makes it it's quite yeah it's quite difficult but you know it's 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 doable um they're the horns I like so yeah well you do it fantastically well so interesting talking about Hanf there so tell us a little bit how did you because you worked with him for four years was it is that right after yeah you know, after college so how did you meet him what was that what was the connection there that was just really through a um, very friendly and enthusiastic gripper, um, jazz fan, I should say. I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> um, who just got hold of? I think I'd done a, I had done a sort of demo CD with with two friends and just a trio thing, and he got hold of it and gave it to Hump, and then Hump said, "Bring, you know, get to come and sit in at the Bull's Head." I mean. I don't know if it was Hunt's suggestion or not. So eventually I did, but I, you know, I hate, I really don't like sitting in and I was terrified. I was so... You, there, are, there might be people listening who don't really know what sitting in means. Can you just explain what that means? Yeah, so basically you just sort of turn up and you don't get a chance to warm up or anything and you just have to, you just get sort of announced, oh, we've got this special person going to gonna play with us. So you just have to get up, get your instrument out and play. You, you know, you're kind of you sort of stick out a bit and it's yeah it's not it's not really my thing but Humph was lovely and and then I sort of left it at that had a it was a real buzz you know and then it was it was months later and I met him he was down the 100 club doing a benefit gig for somebody I was there with somebody else and and he said why didn't you come back to the ball's head so I did go back and then from then on I got kind of asked to do depth when Kathy Stobart was um unable to make the gigs so that's how I got into it really oh right that's it's interesting it's how these things happen isn't it you get asked to do something somebody likes it they see your face a bit and then and yeah. then you deaf a few times and if they like you and you're a nice person and so on then get to stay yeah fantastic so how long were you with the band for it was it was just under four years I left uh 2007 I think so it wasn't long before he passed away. I mean, he's. I came back and then I was because I've been in France for that time, and I came back and um, just did the last. We didn't know, but we knew he was going into hospital. I just happened to do the last gigs that he did, um, you know, which is a massive privilege. So you know, it was it was kind of it was a it was a good time. I learnt loads, learnt a huge amount, and very lucky to be playing, you know, in these venues all over the country that were packed and. Um, it was an amazing experience and I was, you know, kind of young and naive, well, relatively young, naive. And, you know, it was a good way to sort of learn the craft. And uh, and also Hunt was very generous and he let me continue with my 
projects at the same time. So there was, you know, I was able to put depths in, you know, people. Yeah, were... yeah, fantastic. So tell us a bit about the, your own projects then. So were you forming your own groups or quartets or quintets, whatever, at, the, at this time, doing your own thing kind of alongside it? Yeah, I was trying to. I was, I was well, I, I had this demo and then I did a um, quintet album, which um, was absolutely terrifying. I mean... You know, you'd have recorded stuff, and it's it's. At, I mean, I've only just got over this after. You know, I'm, I feel like I'm about ninety because I've been, and it's just taken me so long. But I, yeah, it's just I I I got some really good musicians who I still still know and work with, and you know, um, they kind of pulled me through. I think I was just really nervous, but it was great. I mean, it worked, and it was going to be another sort of more 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 formal sort of demo thing. But it ended up being released and 33 records took it on and, and it kind of gave me a boost. And then I started sending it out. And in those days, I was very organized with paperwork and I had a big kind of list of who to send it to and which follow up and ended up with quite a few gigs. So it kind of snowballed from there. And it's. Yeah, it was it was it was great, but I was sort of. I was inspired. I was just knocked out that somebody wanted to put it on their label, although in jazz terms, it doesn't mean you know, doesn't mean you can retire or anything. It's, uh... No, so, I don't think any jazz, that's not how jazz works, is it? <laughs> oh, wonderful. But so was it about that time when you also formed your quartet with Nikki? Did that come a bit later? Because you, you've been together as a quartet now for, for 10 years, haven't you? So, so this is with Mickey Ars and Dave Green, isn't it, on bass and Steve Brown on drums. Is it about 10 years, 11 years, something like that? Yeah, it's in, well, it's 11 now. It was, we were going to do our 10th anniversary tour last year. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so that I met Nikki, um, we got, I think our first recording and first gigs were in about 2010. And then, but I had met her previously, only a few years before that, around 2008, seven, and we'd gone to Tokyo with Tina May. Um, just the three of us so we you know to do this festival so we got to know each other then and you know it kind of continued it's just it's amazing when you meet people you know that you just love to play with it's just you know you kind of don't have to it's just yeah it's hard to describe but it's so so that relationship musical and and you know we, we've become good friends has continued as it has with tina and we've done all sorts um different albums and we've you know worked with tina as well recording so it's been it's yeah. been really kind of nice collaboration and also there's a link with Steve and Steve and so Steve and Dave go back a long way working together and I used to go and watch Nikki and Steve in Manchester so um before I was playing you know and I was sort of used to go and see them in clubs and stuff yeah that's how lovely it is a very magical when you have a musical connection with somebody and it just becomes a friendship and it's very so it's, it's a really wonderful thing isn't it you don't never want to let that go somehow <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And actually the, the older I get and the more I play, I just I just I really appreciate, you know, the, the, the characters of people I work with and you kind of it's so much about the people to me. Absolutely. And have you you've the most recent thing you've done, is that the trio with um the bass player Simon Thorpe and guitarist Colin Oxley? Did I see that? Has that been released yet? And what's the story behind that? Because that's quite an unusual thing. Oh <laughs> yes. Um Simon's amazing. Simon Thorpe recorded it um, in his house and he got the most amazing sax out. I was so, so chuffed and knocked out by it all. So we, yeah, it was really, it was, it was before lockdown. Um, it was, I can't remember what year it was, but it's the year before lockdown. And we just went to his house with a, armed with manuscript paper and tunes and kind of blasted through them. And then the next day we went back and recorded them all. Um, you know, some of it was stuff I had. I'd only played once, and it wasn't transposed. And I was trying to read off. A, you know, it's all a bit haphazard. But it, I think, it just comes to quite. It's a very relaxed album. Um, so are we, they? Sorry to interrupt. Are they your tunes, or are they arrangements of standards, or? So they're they're a mix. So there's we we each took two or three. So Simon thought there's there's I think there's three of his originals on here. Um, there's two of his originals on here. So the, the CD is called Another Place, and that's one of his tunes. Um, Colin brought along oh Steve Swallow tune called Perdue, which is beautiful, and um, really nice Brazilian tune called Caminos Cruzados, which is, yeah, 
So it's really nice. I took along Funkalero and actually one of my tunes called Blue Jacket, which I wrote for Hump. Um, so it's a real mix. You know, we just, yeah, it's just about the tunes. We did Thad Jones, Lady Luck. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, I mean, it's it's not going to um, break any boundaries, shall we say, but it's it's just, it's nice to get, get again, it goes out to the people and having that interaction and just feeling quite free because no everyone knows where the time is and you know all that so it's yeah it was lovely amazing oh, i'm really looking forward to hearing it i was going to ask you about tunes actually because i've been very fortunate to play with you a few times and i'm always struck with how uh how interesting your choice of uh tunes is it's not you know they're quite unusual a lot of them unusual sequences and unusual tunes less and things it's always fantastically interesting varied set and the, and the concert we've just been listening to I noticed a similar thing, you know, you, there's a Cole Porter tune in there and John Schofield and then the sweet Steve Swan tune and it's a really interesting mix. So when you're out doing a gig, how do you decide what tunes you're going to do? Do you have a sort of a goodies bag of your favourite tunes or are you always listening to things or, I mean, how do you settle on what you're going to play sort of thing? Um, yeah, good question. I do have, I suppose I have a like revolving, very slowly revolving list of favourites. Um, depends who I'm working with, but I'd always try and, I really like, I suppose I, I like tunes that, um, would stand up for, for themselves. So they don't necessarily need any improvising. I mean, that makes it quite hard sometimes. So, but you know, there are certain tunes like the Peacocks, for example, which you, know, you can't, you can't improvise a better line than that. I quite like that challenge and things. I like I like tunes that aren't particularly obvious. I really love um, Thelonious Monk tunes. You know, I need to learn more of those. So I love those tunes. Um, I, yeah, just odd 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 times. Not necessarily odd time signatures, but odd times. And I don't know. I always look for tunes where I can play a line and the, the harmony moves, but I don't have to. And um, I think a lot of a lot of the stuff I play just. It, you know it's just natural I, I just like it and then I find out later oh that's why I like it it's because it's like this one you know yeah that's really interesting <laughs> oh that's fantastic and what about um practicing you know a lot of people don't perhaps aware of how much work goes in behind the scenes with a, for a musician how much practicing gets done and how different people have different ideas about practicing don't they different schedules and so on and I know you're quite busy at the moment you're quite busy teaching on summer schools and so on and, you know I don't know how much time you have for anything else like practicing but do you have a sort of favorite way of practicing or a schedule you like to work to or do um, you have practice or you know what's your thing I'm not I'm not the best I suppose I'm not the most disciplined of person with practice I love practicing but I love playing all the boring bits I'm a bit strange so I really love playing long notes and um not patterns particularly but mainly long just just I could just do that but rather than you know I should probably spend more time sometimes thinking about tunes and you know because I'm often I'll get to a gig and I think why didn't I practice this tune you know more than three times because I've now got you know but actually I think sometimes it keeps things fresh and I kind of think for myself if I've got if I've, if I can keep the facility up and the sound then anything that comes out in a gig is probably is going to be okay um, I can't really plan what I'm going to play because I don't know. So you, you know, it's I don't really spend much time thinking too, too much about harmony. Um, it's may I suppose the most important thing is to learn learn tunes, and for that, lots of listening. Um, and as I've had lots of time during lockdown to do that, which has been lovely. So I've got back into you know loads of jazz stuff, but also classical, and um, I've been writing a bit of. Um, I even wrote some choral music. Wow. So uh, it's been, it, you know, it, it's been terrible pandemic, hasn't it? But, there, you know, some up, some some advantages, you know, think we never have time to do everything we want to do. So I have sort of enjoyed that, um, but I'm ready to get back into it now. Yeah, talking of which, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about how things are sort of opening up again a, a little bit maybe. And um, so have you, have you found that work is starting to pick up and have you got things planned? you know, over the months ahead and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, things, the phones start to ring and it's nice to, you know, chat to people I I know well who haven't haven't seen for a long time. And yeah, things are, I mean, there's all sorts of things. Sadly, there's a few memorial gigs, you know, people we've lost. And 
Um, some of the quartet gigs with Nikki and Dave and Steve have been rescheduled. So we've got a couple of those coming up in the autumn. And Nikki Isles' is, um, jazz orchestra, which is going to be very exciting. So um, that's going to be sort of the highlight of the autumn, I think, for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's a tour, isn't there? That because there was a tour planned and then had to sort of obviously be cancelled. So has the tour been rescheduled then starting, is it this autumn? Yeah. Yeah. So we I think starts at Scarborough in uh September. And uh yeah, and then we've we've got a few dates through October and maybe one in November to this year, then there'll be more next year. So yeah, it's it's very, very exciting. I mean it's amazing music and it's challenging. So it's been I really love getting my teeth into other people's sort of projects and, you know, I love that because you, you haven't got any of the responsibility, but you can just kind of enjoy the music. Yeah, I love how you talk about challenge and you obviously quite relish it, you know, the kind of challenge of things. That's lovely. I identify with that a lot. <laughs> That's great. Well, Karen, it's been so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat. And um, I hope you'll come back down to Guildford and do a gig sometime soon too. We'd love to. Have you back? It'd be great to see you. But uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank I hope to see you very soon. Absolutely.